Welcome to the latest webinar brought to you by the Lighting Design Lab and Seattle City Light. We're going to wait for just a couple of moments to allow folks to finish signing in and settle down. And we will begin with our webinar about 10.03 or so. So uh, settle in and I will be back to join you shortly. All right, good morning, everyone. Once again, welcome to the latest webinar uh, series brought to you by the Lighting Design Lab. Today, we are going to talk about energy management systems. This will be part one of two. Energy management systems part two will be next week, same time, same place. Let me go through a couple of housekeeping announcements here. So during the class, everybody's gonna be muted. It would be great if we could all kind of go ahead and raise our hands and chat at, as we'd like. Unfortunately, that doesn't work so well with the webinar platform. So uh, when you do have questions, and please ask your questions when you have them, use the question bar. If you look in your GoToWebinar interface, you'll notice uh, something that says questions. That's a down carrot. Hit that. And within that space, you should be able to go ahead and ask questions. Uh, Type them as they come. We may not answer them immediately in real time. We'll kind of judge and curate that. We may wait until a uh, question period of break, but please go ahead and type them as they come up to you. Now, uh, there are going to be a number of online polls. Uh, these folks are using Slido, so please participate in those. It's a very helpful way for the instructors to be able to gain information, particularly about who you're, we're talking to, and also um, gain some understanding about uh, a variety of different topics that, that may be together. Also, following the class, we, Lighting Design Lab, will have a short survey. Please go ahead and take that. It's very helpful for us to understand uh, what it is that uh, you folks are looking for from educational opportunities so that we can go ahead and mold our offerings to meet those for you. So please go ahead and do that. Now, as always, there will be a recording and a slide deck from the presentation that we posted about a week later uh, on the Lighting Design Lab webpage. So lightingdesignlab.com, go to the education tab and you'll find it there. And you can always go ahead and ping me, sean.dara at seattle.gov. Um, that will be later on in the presentation. You'll be able to see that. Or at lightingdesignlab at seattle.gov. We can also go ahead and field questions for you about a variety of topics. Now, of course, this class is brought to you by the Lighting Design Lab and Seattle City Light. We, of course, are very happy to be part of Seattle City Light your favorite electric utility and mine. 
we work with, of course, uh, a variety of folks, uh, just as we always have for the last, what, 33 years, uh, end use customers, trade allies, design, design allies. Um, we work with a lot of different types of folks. Uh, of course, we're branching out from, from just lighting and lighting controls into uh, building electrification, energy management systems, and all those things. But typically, we have had four core service areas, of course, right? Education training, which uh, we have here. Uh, we evaluate technology, we offer tools and resources, for example, light meters, things like that. Uh, and we provide information aggregation. You know, we go out to a variety of the various uh, industry conferences, bring back information uh, so that not everybody has to go out to do the same things. So all of that said, I am now going to hand off presentation, give me just a moment, over to Michelle Segehorn, who is going to be our instructor today, and Diane Rasmussen from DNR International, who will be our um, who will be our moderator uh, for questions. So Michelle, there you go. Take it away. I am going to be in the background. If you need anything, if there are any technical issues, uh, I will be here uh, in the background for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Let me make sure here. All right, we're sharing my screen. Um, good morning, everyone. Yes, my name is Michelle Sagehorn, uh, and I will be your instructor today for this energy management class. So let me start off by maybe telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so I have been in the energy consulting industry for over 15 years now. Uh, primarily, my focus has been on doing commissioning. Uh, if any of you maybe are familiar, maybe not familiar, basically commissioning is a quality assurance process. So I usually am involved in the design from early in the design phase all the way through construction and even into post-occupancy. And really my job is to kind of make sure that the goals and the design intent um, that we define with the owner at the beginning of the project actually gets implemented and that it actually works properly uh, at the end of the day. So I get, I've, in my career, I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of great projects, you know, high performance projects to net zero, um, zero carbon, uh, complicated to labs or a typical office or school. And so I've definitely seen a lot of different systems, designs, um, buildings. Um, I also get to work with uh, the controls contractor a lot. So I'm working on the building management system as well as if the client has an energy management system. So I've seen a lot of different flavors and varieties of both BMS and EMS systems. Uh, and hopefully today I'm gonna share with you kind of what I'm seeing out there in the field, maybe some of the lessons learned, what's working, what's not working, and just kind of be able to hopefully um, shed a little knowledge on this EMS system. All right, so what? Uh, let's talk briefly about what the agenda is. As mentioned, this is a two-day course. So today we're going to talk about, you know, what is an EMS, um, why would you need one or want to get one, you know, the business case behind it, and then the difference between a BMS and EMS and why is it important to understand, you know, the difference between the two. Um, and then t next week on day, you know, our day two, which will be next week, we'll do a lot, uh, a deeper dive into an EMS system and also kind of the qualities of an effective, effective EMS. Just because you have one or you have that software doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be successful. So we'll get into that, and then of course uh, we'll do uh, we'll finish up with some case studies. Um, so the goal for me is not only to define what an EMS is, uh, but also to kind of share what the value of an EMS is, and as I mentioned, how to actually successfully use and implement one. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start off with a poll just to kind of get going here. So as mentioned, we're going to use slido.com. If you guys could do that right now, you can go to that slido.com and enter the event code, or also you could scan that QR code from um, one of your devices as well. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that now. Start us off. And oops. Okay. 
be great to kind of understand where you guys, what your knowledge of EMS systems are as we start this presentation and kind of what you're interested in learning about today. Um, so hopefully we can answer all those questions. So please feel free to share anything. All right, here we go. Good news, it's working. All right, somebody's definitely here for it. Love to see that. <laughs> totally understand. Need a minute to warm up for sure. Go ahead and go. All right, all sorts of different answers from aggregated system controlling various building systems, hopefully holistically, not sure, energy modeling simulation. Okay, great. Um, let's see if we can define this better for everybody today. But yeah, great to see kind of what your thoughts are. Go ahead, and what are you interested in learning about? Best practices, Division 25 spec, why is an EMS important? What's the main function is, and can I do one myself? Okay, and getting updated on my knowledge. All right, love it. Well, let's go ahead and then dive in here um, on what an EMS is. Um, so an EMS, as we know, stands for Energy Management System. It is a software platform used to monitor, analyze, control, and optimize energy use. Um, I think this definition is pretty simple and straightforward, but the honest truth is, is that it's kind of, once you get out into the field or in the marketplace, it's, it's pretty hard to actually sometimes describe or distinguish. In fact, there's a lot of confusion within the building industry about what constitutes an EMS and how it went it can be useful. Uh, the how and when it can be useful, we're gonna definitely get to that, and that's probably a little bit more later into the presentation, but kind of what is an EMS? Um, and it's hard, and the reason why it's hard is one of the reasons is that there's a lot of different flavors out there, you know, a lot of different manufacturers, brands, uh, they look a lot different, um, and they definitely are not created equal. Some of them have different features and functions that others do not. And then the other reason that it can be really challenging is that the industry in general has a lot of acronyms, right? And they, unfortunately, even the most seasoned professionals in the field often use them interchangeably, and that can be very confusing. For example, we talked about BMS, Building Management System. There's also a BAS, Building Automation System. Essentially, those two things are the exact same thing. Um, and then when we talk about an energy management systems, I've seen it as EMIS, which is energy management information system, and also EMCS, which is energy management control system. So there's a lot of different terminology out there. You might hear some other things like analytics software or fault detection diagnostics, so there, or dashboard. There's definitely a lot of words kind of swirling around this EMS. But the one thing I'd like to convey is that the EMS is an important tool and a useful tool. And I would maybe go so far as to argue that it's becoming almost necessary for not only achieving energy efficiency, but being able to maintain it and have that persistent energy savings over the life of the building. Um, and the reason for that is because buildings in general are becoming more complicated. You know, as we kind of move towards net zero buildings and trying to be more sustainable, um, we're using, you know, unique systems, unique pieces of equipment, um, but even more, we're trying to use controls in a different way to save as much energy as we can. And that in itself makes things a lot more complicated. Um, so I think at the heart of it though, when you really start with an energy management system, the really the key is that you have to measure something. If you don't measure it, you can't improve it and you surely can't manage it. So, you know, at, at the minimum, it needs to be a system that monitors and measures your energy use of your building. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about a timeline just to give a little bit of context and background. So energy management, the term energy management probably became kind of prevalent in the 1970s. And there, there's a reason for it. There was definitely some significant events. Most notably is, you know, the price of oil that basically quadrupled at this time. Probably not all that different from what we're experiencing now, but ultimately that event really made people take a, a notice to, you know, energy use and how much they were using. In fact, the 1970s became kind of known as um, the, a conservation, focus on conservation, save energy. Um, I remember sometimes them having light, um, a little sign by the light switch that would say, turn it off, you know, when not in use. So again, just about not using energy. But at this point, energy managers didn't exist and there probably was not any energy management systems. Probably at the minimum, we have our energy or utility bill. But as we moved into the 1980s, um, things started to change. You know, companies started to dedicate a position. So the energy manager became a position. And of course we had the introduction of the personal computers. So now we started to get some tools and maybe our first energy management systems kind of probably started to develop at this fit stage. Um, but as we moved into the 1990s, things started to shift again uh, because energy prices declined. There was a lot of corporate downsizing and really having an energy efficiency project didn't really make a lot of economical sense at that time. You know, having that simple payback period just wasn't happening. Uh, so it was a, a kind of a step backwards. But then as we move into 2000 and then to today, um, obviously there's been, uh, again, a refocus on energy. Um, energy prices begin to rise again. Um, now it might be more, we hear things like carbon reduction, clean energy, you know, maybe a little different flavor of how we describe it. Uh, but the climate change agenda really became a major focus for both individuals and companies. You started seeing, you know, companies making clear commitments. And of course, computers evolve faster, you know, more data, being able to store it more, um, and of course, much more affordable. So obviously we um, have kind of continued to evolve those tools and that energy management system into what it is today. Okay, so as I mentioned, kind of starting off, probably starting off with utility bills, maybe entering them into a spreadsheet. Um, but, you know, when companies started to pay attention to this, the, you know, probably the first question they would ask is, am I efficient or how good is my building? How am I doing? Um, so one of the first tools that probably kind of evolved was benchmarking. So benchmarking is simply just looking at your energy use over a 12 month period and that can be a rolling period. And when you do that, you're able to compare, you know, year over year how you're doing. So am I doing better or worse than last year? Maybe I'm doing the same. And that's a way to be able to kind of say whether your building's doing well or if it's starting to decline. Um, but then you can go a step further and you can take that energy use uh, over that 12 month period and you can divide it by the square footage of the building. And that gives you a number. And in the industry, we call that an EUI, an energy use index. And what the intention behind it is, is to be able to compare buildings against each other. Now, you, you probably cannot, you know, you can't compare an office building to a lab building. A lab is obviously gonna be more energy intensive and may even run 24 seven, but you can compare an office building to another office building. And that way you might be able to say, well, I am better than the average, or maybe I'm worse. And again, another way to say how you're doing. Um, but if you come back and you find that you're doing worse than the average, what do you do then? And that's where, you know, but this benchmarking tool is not going to be able to provide you that additional details. But don't get me wrong, it's, it is a good tool. It's still used today. And I would say that, you know, by all means, most buildings should be looking at their energy use on a rolling 12-month period for sure. But it's just not enough, right? We need more tools in our toolbox. Because once we kind of see that we're not doing maybe as efficient as we'd like, we gotta be able to dig in there and start to understand why and be able to get some useful information. So how do we do that? Well, um, you know, again, the, an EMS really needs to understand energy usage and the costs uh, in a meaningful way. And modern day computers and software help us do that, but also help us do it very efficiently and effectively. So another tool that's used is the energy profile. And so what that is, is basically, again, looking at your building's energy use over a 24-hour period. 
And usually it looks kind of like a bell curve um, for the most part, especially in an office. And, you know, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you when your building uses energy. You know, do I use it in the morning, night, afternoon, you know, weekends, you know? And so it gives you an idea, again, how your building's using energy. But what becomes really effective is when you start to looking at it day over day. So I'm comparing Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday and so on. And when you do that, you start to see, you know, what is your reoccurring pattern for your building's energy use. But more importantly, you start to, besides those patterns, you start to see things that are different, you know, spikes or anomalies, things that aren't normal. And that's where you can start to dive in and say, okay, what's this? Let's, where am I going with this? Um, but in order to do that, we need real-time data. And um, I know we all probably have smart meters out there, but most new construction buildings are going even further and installing their own you know, whole building meter as well as a lot of sub-metering. But um, that gives them data, you know, is even more than hourly. You know, they, uh, most buildings I'm seeing is going, you know, they want data every minute um, and it's automatic, you know, so this real time is really helpful. You know, we're not gonna wait around for our utility bill basically. Um, it'll, and the reason why it's important is that it allows users to make decisions more frequently about their energy use. Um, but also, as we're moving towards these net zero buildings, you know, we're seeing but more buildings with on-site generation, you know, PV, um, storage, batteries, and being able to load shift um, and things like that. And in order to do that, we definitely need to know how our energy is being and when it's being used. Okay, so let's get into a couple examples of energy management systems. Um, what you see on the screen right now are three different examples. Um, we have one from the state of California. We have one from a campus. This happens to be UC Davis. And then we have one from a building. What you might notice is that they all look different. And that's OK. Um, at the end of the day, that's pretty typical. Um, an EMS is really um, supposed to be kind of customized for each client. Because at the end of the day, they all have different goals. They all have different metrics that they want to measure and things that are important to them. So at the end, of, that's kind of why you're going to see the difference between the three of them. Now, we've included the um, links to those different sites below. I would kind of encourage you guys on your own time to maybe browse around. I find it very interesting to kind of go look what's out there, the different, again, different flavors and different functionalities and which things I like and don't like. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, and I think all three of these are very good. But I am going to take a minute here to show you one of them because UC Davis, I got to be honest, is one of my favorites. And the reason for it is how visual it is. Let me go ahead and, oops, sorry, I'm on the wrong screen here. Get to that first screen. Okay, so what you're looking at here is their campus and all the little dots are the buildings on campus. And then the kind of circles around them are the energy use intensity of that particular building. So obviously the larger the circle, the more energy that building uses. And what I really like about it is if I wasn't like sustainability manager on this campus, I could easily look at this and say, which buildings use the most energy on campus? It's just really obvious. And obviously that may be the area that you would probably most likely focus on. Let's go ahead and look at one of them, this young hall over here. And as you kind of hover over it, you'll see some information there. First of all, it lets you know that it's a lab. So in general, labs do use more energy. So it's kind of letting you know, hey, this might not be the same as some of the other buildings on campus. Uh, but then when you look above it, it has two different numbers there. The first one that's 693, that's that EUI number that I just referred to, that energy use index. Um, and then the one below it, it the average lab EUI. Um, so kind of, again, going back to the database, we're able to compare to all the other labs in the database. So at first, if you only saw that 693, you wouldn't know if this is buildings good or bad, um, but now we're able to compare it to all the labs. And basically you'll see that it's more than double than the average. So to me, that might be a good indicator that there's some room for improvement here at this particular building. Whereas if you went maybe to this library down here, um, it's obviously a lot lower, but the other thing you also notice is that it's 64 uh, versus the average for a building of this type at 110. So in this case, 
it's below the average, this might not be a building that I would focus on, um, at least not be a high priority. So if I go back to this, uh, I wanted to show you guys a couple more things. There's a lot on this website, so there's a lot to kind of discover. But ultimately, when you click on it, you'll see some more information about the building. But then you can go look and view some energy data. And give it a second to load here. What you're looking at is that particular building, a couple of their systems. But we're going to just go ahead and look at the chilled water for a second. So when you look at that data, um, kind of like, well, is it good? Is it bad? I'm not sure. Um, definitely good information, but I'm not sure what that means. Um, what I like about this web or this EMS system is that it gives you some information about their chilled water system, but it also tells you how to look at the data and how to kind of say what's the normal usage versus what to look for. Um, you know, what you're looking at here is obviously the energy use, but you're also looking this black line is the outside air temperature. So in the evening, when the temperatures go down, we shouldn't need as much cooling, and therefore we should see this energy, the blue, go down. Whereas if you saw something more like this over the course of several days where the temperature is going down for the cold weather, but that load or that energy use of that chilled water plant stays essentially the same or well above it, um, probably is letting you know that there's something suspicious going on and you should go investigate it a bit further. So I think this is just an important point point that you know people need to not only get the data but know how to read it and what to do with it and I thought this was really great um, I want to show one more thing here real quick um, they also have this kind of page where they're showing kind of their cumulative savings over a fiscal year um, from doing all their energy efficiency projects which is great um, and they go you can actually go into each and every building and look at the different um, projects they're working on and whether they're saving or not saving but how they're doing. And I guess the point that I wanted to mention here is that when you decide to implement an energy management system, it's not just the software, right? Or just implementing this EMS that's gonna make you successful. Because no matter how sophisticated these systems get, even if they can tell you exactly what the issue is, it's air handler number one, it's the damper is broken or stuck, somebody still has to physically go out there and fix it. You know, I don't think we're anywhere near having some robot go out and do that. So at the end of the day, there's still a people element that needs to occur in order to be successful with energy management, for sure. So uh, the reason I just wanted to share that with you is that, you know, these guys do a really good job of um, documenting and um, creating a process around their energy management system. So I'm going to go back to the slides. Okay. So I wanted to give a couple more examples. Um, I call these visualizations, and you guys are probably going to hear me say visualization a lot. But again, this is one of the great things about an EMS, is it displays the data visually in a way that hopefully is very obvious of what's going on or to be able to pick out anomalies or spikes or things that don't look right. Um, so the clearer it is, the better visualization it is. So let me start by just looking at energy use, this one down in the right-hand lower corner. What you're looking at down there is uh, basically the energy use of a building broken out by its end use. So you're seeing the HVAC, the lighting, plug loads, domestic hot water, and process loads. The thing that obviously jumps out at me is it's very clear what's using the most energy, the HVAC system. The other thing on this chart you'll notice is it has like three months, like May, June, July. That's also important is because at the end of the day, we always need to compare something. In order to find that spike or that anomaly, we are generally comparing something to something else. So in this case, we're comparing month over month. You know, If we implemented an energy efficiency measure in August, we could then come back and look at the data and hopefully we would see a, a, you know, a decent decrease in the energy use in, let's say it was in the HVAC category. Um, so to me, this is kind of an obvious one. I, I feel like almost every energy management system should have some kind of chart like this or graph like this. Being able to compare your energy from day to day or month to month or from this year versus last year, again, very helpful and useful to people. So to me, again, it's to me kind of a basic one that should almost always be there. Um, but let's talk about a couple other ones uh, you might see. 
and in general, EMS systems have a lot of visualization. So there's usually a lot of different charts and different pages or screens. Um, and the one for HVAC up here, what we're looking at here, what's called a heat map. I actually love heat maps because what it essentially is able to do is look at a ton of data. So you could look at every single, like let's say VAV box or reheat coil um, in your entire building on one chart like this. And often you can look at it over several weeks, days, maybe even months on one single chart. So in this case, let's assume this is just air handling unit and this is an office building. And so when you see um, the red, that basically means that the unit's on or it's using energy. And the first three bars you'll see kind of, um, it seems pretty normal for an office. Um, you know, the yellow or the green is when it's off or not using energy. So that seems right over a 24 hour period. And then you can clearly obviously pick out the line at the bottom where the red goes all the way across. And in that case, that's where the HVAC was left on all night. And obviously you could go dig into that a little deeper as to why that was and if that's truly a problem or not. Um, and let me show one more. Um, let's look at the load uh, profile for plug loads down here. Um, this is basically an energy profile like what I just described a few minutes ago. And so you're able to see the plug loads over a 24 hour period you're seeing three different lines there, the green, the yellow, and the red or orange. And if you had only one of those lines on there, let's just say the red one, um, again, you would look at this data and go, okay, but I'm not really sure, again, if it's good, bad, or what does it mean? Now, as you start to overlay, um, which we're looking at three days of data here, um, you'll see that the red during the off hours or unoccupied hours, there's a significant decrease there. So basically what happened was they implemented an energy efficiency measure and had everyone turn off their computers at night or automatically did that and obviously we were able to save some energy so you're able to visually see that it actually worked as well as maybe um how much you know being able to quantify how much energy that measure actually um was all right oops so one more example, um, what you're looking at is a chilled water system. This is something that you would typically probably see this information on a building management system. And as a commissioning agent, this might be something that I would look at to see if a building was performing properly or not, uh, or a system was. And so again, with the chilled water, this gray line here, that is the gallons per minute of chilled water that we're pumping to all the different devices to provide cooling. And then the top line is our outside air temperature. So again, as we decrease in outside air temperature, we're gonna need less cooling and therefore the gallons per minute also declines. And so essentially these two lines or trends are kind of following each other for the most part. And that's correct, that's the way it should be. So if I was looking at this as a commissioning agent, I would say, this looks fine. The system looks like it's doing what it's supposed to and all looks good. But then if you're able to add one more piece of information, so if you're able to add um, your the pump, the chilled water pump power, the amps there, you can see that it's flatline. And so that's incorrect or that kind of reveals the problem. Um, ultimately, as we slow down in GPM, our pump should slow down as well as uh, the pump speed and therefore the amp and the energy use should also slow down or go lower. And so we would expect maybe a very similar curve to kind of follow along with the other two. And clearly we're not seeing that. So what we were able to do is reveal a problem that didn't, you know, we didn't see previously. Um, and so I would, you know, say that, you know, this gives us the whole picture or the bigger picture. Um, and one thing to note is that even though there's the capability to bring in energy data into the BMS, it's not that typical to do that. Um, I would say that nowadays it's getting more and more typical, um, but often that piece of information is not there. Where an EMS can take all of that data, the BMS data, the outside air temperature, the GPM, and um, the electric data as well, uh, and kind of do analysis on it. Okay, so then let's talk for a minute about kind of what 
the marketplace is right now today and maybe where it's going and kind of in the future. Uh, I mentioned earlier um, the term analytics or analytics software. And maybe the first question is, well, what is it? And is it an EMS? Um, so an analytics software is basically obviously taking some data, analyzing it, and hopefully giving some useful information as a result. And an analytics software can really analyze any data. It doesn't have to be energy, it doesn't have to be BMS, but it can do all of the above. Um, and so maybe I can give an example of um, what an analytics software does. That might be the best way to describe it. So in California, probably also Seattle, you know, West Coast, we are able to take advantage of the mild weather a lot of times. And most buildings will have an economizer on their air handling unit. So we're bringing in that outside air when it's you know, moderate temperature outside so that we don't have to heat and cool it and therefore save energy. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of economizers don't work or they break and they're not working properly. And so how would you know if your economizer is working properly or not? You know, if you're going to do it on the BMS, it's, it's challenging because you have to look at a lot of different data points. You need to look at the outside air temperature, the return air temperature, the supply air versus its set point, maybe the damper positions, uh, chilled water valve positions. So there's a lot of different pieces and parts you would need to look at to kind of really analyze whether the system's working properly. Where the analytics software would take all of that data, do its analysis, and then kind of spit something out and say, you know, yesterday there was three hours during the day that you should have been using your economizer and taking advantage of free cooling, and you were not. Um, and so that's kind of the advantage there is it does that analysis for you and it does it kind of uh, all the time. It's constantly looking at that kind of stuff and um, making those analysis for you. So that software comes kind of prepackaged with a lot of these analytics in it. So at the end of the day, I, I would say, yes, it is an EMS. Uh, as long as it's bringing in energy data, um, I would say for sh it definitely fits that category. Um, with the analytics software, there might be something else that you start to hear about is maybe some predictive algorithms, some computer learning or AI technology. And so I personally have not seen that implemented on a real project to date, but I do know that's kind of where they're going with this um, software. They're definitely hoping, because even if we have a, a building meter that's telling us, you know, pretty much instantaneously um, our energy use, we're still reacting to it, right? It's still a reactive thing versus what they're trying to do is be proactive. And a good example of that is we can predict the weather. So if Monday it's going to be 95 degrees out and then Tuesday it's saying it's going to drop back down to like 80, uh, what this you know, predictive algorithm would do is understand that and then go physically change the set points without anybody actually doing anything. It would do it on its own and then say, well, we can change the set points on uh, when it gets cooler out and we can save a little bit of energy from you know, not having to cool as much kind of thing. And so it would change set points. So that's kind of where they're going. Like I said, it's not quite there, but um, we may be seeing that soon. Um, other things that I would say about EMSs is, is that they're going obviously beyond energy um, and even beyond HVAC uh, as far as analytics and analyzing. Um, what I've seen some clients doing is um, looking at like attendance information and correlating it to like thermal comfort. Uh, so they might look at, at, you know, their security or their turnstiles, how many people are in the building or how many um, conference rooms are being used, uh, things like that. As well as there's a lot of other metrics that are important to people, as I mentioned, you know, indoor air quality has become extremely important with COVID, with some of the fires we're seeing on the West Coast and things like that. So it gives us the ability to look at other metrics as well. And as I mentioned, the internet of things, devices, um, things that you might not typically connect with an EMS, um, you're able to do that a lot easier now. Um, another good one is where uh, clients will bring in like maintenance information like work orders or something like that and they might correlate that to failures or pieces of equipment and that can give some great information um, from either procurement or um, just in general um, you know maybe a particular vendor you don't want to buy anymore or you're having a lot of trouble with so you're able to do that um, in an EMS and then the other thing I would mention that honestly has been an idea for a long time but I just really haven't seen it come to fruition 
is that we really want one central location for everything. And what you see a lot is that we have a photovoltaic system and that PV system has its own dashboard. Uh, you know, you go to what, the web page and it has its own dashboard where it says, and then you have your BMS and you might even have a separate lighting system. And then you might even have like your meters or your sub metering electrical meters on a different web page. So it's all in different locations. That's not very useful. You know, a great example is if you had a net zero building, you need to know how much solar you're producing and how much energy your building's consuming. And really you need those two pieces of information on the same chart, uh, you know, to be able to say what, how you're doing. And that doesn't really work very well. So having one location for everything is, is really helpful. You know, it's problematic from the perspective of me, the commissioning agent, because integration actually can be very challenging to get it done and done properly in the field. But that's, a, in my opinion, a problem that we need to overcome because at the end of the day, we still have to provide something for the client so that they can maintain their building and again, get useful information. And I think the only way to do that is get all the information in one central location. And then finally, um, I would say the controlling feature. So going back to that acronym EMCS, um, energy management systems probably started off being more informational, you know, just reporting and measuring um, information. Now we're getting to the point where they're, they're able to do actual control features like demand control, demand limiting, um, and things like that. So that's kind of the, the state of... Uh, energy management systems right now and a little bit about where I think they're going. Let's go ahead and um, stop now and see, well, one, if anybody has any questions, but two, maybe see if maybe your opinion of what the definition of an EMS is, has maybe changed a little bit based on our, our conversation. I'll give you guys a, a minute or two to give some feedback. All right, monitor, analyze, control, yep. A management system that allows monitoring of current conditions of energy use. Yep, absolutely. All right. Okay, well, let's see. I'm gonna go ahead and move, to move, keep moving. But again, if anybody has any questions at any time, please feel free to throw them up there. Okay, we're going to go ahead and kind of move into the next section here. So what's kind of the business? Oh, we, we have one question. It just popped in. Okay. From PV, are there any design standards for monitoring systems so that they don't each need to be specified from scratch? Have you seen much trending of KW per ton of total cooling system? Okay, so I think that's a couple different questions. Um, let me see. So the first one being about specifications, um, I think, I think this is a, a really good question because, you know, typically in Division 25, um, it, we have our building management system, and it will have its own specification section that really defines what it is, what you know, what performance you're looking out of for it, you know, what features, um, you know, how much data can it store, that kind of stuff. Um, trending capability. So it really gets into the nitty gritty details of what a building management system should be. Um, I haven't seen a lot regarding an EMS system. 
And so one of the things that I've been kind of promoting and talking to a lot of engineers, architects, owners about is that we need a specification that's specifically for it, you know, if you're going to implement an energy management system, we need a specification section for that. Now, um, I agree starting from scratch and it's not ideal. And so that's a good question. I can um, provide a link and I do, I think maybe we also have it on our website at Red Car Analytics. Um, we'll get to that I think today. I have a blog that I just recently wrote and there's some references in it. And so one of the things that I saw recently was um, I believe Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has created kind of a specification uh, sample or whatever you want to say template for an EMS system. And it really, in, in some regards, it asks a lot of questions, um, like what are you looking for your, in your EMS? And it helps you kind of guide you create uh, an actual specification for the client specifically to their needs. So that's probably the best reference that I have right now. Um, unfortunately, I wish I could throw out dozens of them, uh, but that's, that's actually one of the problems out there. Um, so yeah, so I think that might be the first question. And then the second one was regarding um, have I seen a lot of trending for, let's see, it was KW per ton, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, again, another great question. Um, so on a BMS, I would say, no, I have not. Um, but again, it's it's something that we're trying to go towards. We're gonna talk a little bit um, today about it, and I think there's an example, but creating some custom metrics. Um, because we need to dig a little bit deeper, you know, okay, like that chart where it showed the HVAC being the highest energy user. Now we need to dig into the HVAC. You know, what is it? Is it our chilled water plant? And looking at something like KW per ton or like in a fan or an air handler, you know, watt, uh, CFM per watt, those are things that are helpful to dig in a little bit deeper into that specific system to see if it's, you know, operating as intended or as efficient as we want it to. So we definitely want to get to those types of metrics to be displayed and monitored. Um, we also want to have set points so that we know whether that, that KW per ton is actually good or bad. And so that's something that I tend to like push with engineers in the design phase to say, well, what is this plant designed for? What should the KWs per ton be? And so that we can kind of monitor that to say, oh, you know, we're running way above that or, or maybe we're doing good and we're running right you know right at where we expected so it, it is about not only like you said trending that but also knowing what are kind of the range that it should be operating within um, and identifying that so very good questions all right um, there's not anything else I'll move on here nope she said thank you Michelle good answers okay great <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're going to actually do an activity here, guys. I think our first um, uh, little activity I'm going to ask you guys to do, and, and Diane, if you could put that uh, link there uh, into the chat so people could just copy and paste it, that'd be great. Um, so this is just a case study for a building, and this happens to be a JW Marriott hotel. They obviously um, basically implemented an energy management system, and so they kind of describe what they did and how it became successful. And so um, what we'd like you guys to do is to go ahead and read that and kind of come back with your thoughts. And again, this section is about making a business case for an EMS. So anything you might see that, you know, gives good reason as to why they did it or if it was effective. Uh, and then we will have a little poll afterwards, a Slido poll that you guys can share your thoughts or again, if there's questions, whatever you'd like to share. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys like 10 minutes so we'll uh, maybe come back right before 11 and um, yeah, see what, uh, kind of have a little discussion about what you read and I'll be kind of be quiet here for the next 10 minutes and give you guys that time. So yeah, if you could please go do that, that'd be great.
Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you guys a minute. There was another kind of follow-up question to that Division 25 um, in regards to why wouldn't Division 25 integration automation be used for an EMS specification? So sorry, I might not have been perfectly clear. I think it would actually reside within Division 25. I guess where I was going is that it should be probably its own section within Division 25. Um, because it may, again, you may want some different features and different functionality than you might get out of a BMS.
All right, guys, if you want to kind of finish up or wrap that up. Um, we, have another, okay. we have another question too. Sure. Uh, Phoebe is wanting to know, to what extent are the BAS and EMS normally interconnected? Um, again, good question. Um, I would say that in all honesty, um, and I do mostly um, new construction, not that um, we don't get into some existing buildings as well, but a lot of the new construction, I would say the majority of it, even if it's small or large projects, generally will have a BMS um, or some control system at some point. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of clients uh, actually choosing to do an EMS. And I think there's a little bit of not understanding the difference. In fact, part of the reason kind of for my recent blog was to be able to share that with my clients to kind of describe to them because I, I'll be honest with you, I get questions all the time. What do you mean I have a EMS, right? And they actually mean a BMS and they don't actually understand the difference between them. Um, but I do know that, and actually I think the city of Seattle, because um, I actually got some of the references from some of your guys' um, pages, web pages, but um, I believe new construction in C city of Seattle does require an energy management system and I was actually rather impressed because it actually kind of went into a little bit of detail as to what an EMS should be and some of the features and functions it should have, uh, which is not necessarily something that I think is actually all that common yet. Um, so if I'm lucky enough to get kind of in early on the project, um, I get to talk with the owner and try to help guide them through that process of whether they really need one or not. Um, but um, in general, uh, it, it really just kind of depends. You know, I think there's a lot of different flavors for larger buildings. If a client has, um, you know, multiple, like a campus or multiple buildings in their portfolio versus if it's a single building or a really small building. I will talk a little bit more about that later, but it's a lot more challenging to find a solution for some sometimes the small buildings. I will admit a lot of these softwares are geared more towards either larger buildings or portfolios. Um, so I'm not sure if I hopefully answered partly some of that, but please feel free with a follow-up question if I didn't quite answer that. She's good, she says thanks. Okay. All right, well, while we're waiting here to see if anybody wants to participate in the poll, let me, talk about this uh, Marriott case study a little bit and maybe some of my observations. Again, we started this section about a business case as to why we would want or need an EMS. But one of the things that I really took away from this article was you know, some of their reasonings for, or elements to the success. Um, and one of them being their, you know, there was a strong commitment from their management team and that they created a team that was multi-department or multi-discipline, you know, bringing in people with different backgrounds and um, knowledge, and then creating a process around that on how to deal with it, and then understanding the importance of obviously training the staff as well, how to use EMS, how to look at the data, what to do with it, and then obviously communicating with employees is another thing. You know, engaging employees in energy efficiency is um, a great thing to do, and that's also something that probably doesn't happen as often as it should. So those were some of the things that I took away um, actually from this case study and kind of aligns with what I was saying earlier about um, the UC Davis um, EMS system and that they created a process around it um, also to be, to be successful. All right, let's see, oops. Sorry guys, I thought I saw an answer there in the poll. Wait another few seconds here. Okay, here we go. Would be worth learning about ISO 5001, what is it? Um, how do we get a copy of that? Um, so I believe <laughs> it takes a village to be successful. I like that one. Um, the ISO 5000, um, a lot of times, uh, I believe it also is a certification kind of process. Um, 
part of it is documentation, um, you know, documenting what you do and the process that you use and kind of document control. There's part of that. But there's also, um, uh, I'm not sure, I might be referencing the wrong thing. There's also one that really talks about measurement and verification and how to um, basically kind of, again, measure something, verify it, and it has procedures and process that's kind of related to it. Um, if it's the one I'm thinking of, and I'll, I'll double check here as we go to break um, and maybe come back to you, but um, I think that that might be what we're referencing in that uh, particular article. Um, it's pretty you know, detailed. If you're somebody who's involved in um, measurement and verification, I would say it's a good resource. Uh, if not, it might be a little bit too much detail than you need. Uh, but again, it's really about kind of the process of doing that measurement and verification. What factors are essential for the success of an energy management system? Management support, yeah, great. Measure the outcome, mm-hmm. And corporate and management buy-in. Great answers, guys. Okay. Okay, so another key driver for business case uh, for an EMS is climate change goals, right? Um, so I happen to be showing you California, uh, but I'm sure that Seattle and Washington have uh, uh, targets as well. Uh, the one, on the left-hand side is our greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, California is trying, if you look at that red line, by 2050, um, trying to be 80% below its 1990 levels. So that's a pretty aggressive goal. You know, I mean, that line's pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, California is also trying to be on 100% renewable energy by 2052. And again, a pretty steep goal, considering we all know that we have some reliability issues within our electrical grid. But in effort to kind of keep moving forward to meet that goal, we need to come up with solutions, right? And we need to come up with some creative ones. So, um, you know, California uh, and utility companies all around are asking buildings to perform some of these control strategies, like, again, demand response, demand limiting, energy storage, um, and things like that. And so those things, these strategies have evolved significantly to meet kind of the needs of California's changing energy uh, landscape. And uh, again, I'm sure there's many of these strategies may be um, common in Seattle as well. Um, but how do we do that? You know, we need a system that can do that. So an EMS is a system that can do those types of strategies. And then if you look at the chart on the right, again, there's our commercial building. And you know, commercial buildings in general are found to waste on average around 30% of the energy they consume. So they're obviously contributors to our greenhouse gas emissions. You know, in my opinion, we all need to play a part and in including buildings. And so again, what you see there is a chart that's kind of breaking out that energy, the energy by end use. And again, our space heating seems to be the larger category. But then, you know, it's again giving us that opportunity to hopefully be able to make an impact. Um, and again, use the data in a way so that we can help achieve our goals there for climate change. All right. Okay, and so another reason, um, value of an EMS, I would say this is compliance requirements or sustainability choices. Um, we're starting to see more and more state, cities, ordinances, making them more compliance requirements. But there's definitely, clients and buildings out there that are just doing these things for, you know, because it's the right thing to do and it's a sustainability choice. So the logos on the right are all certification pro processes and you guys may be familiar probably most likely with LEED, uh, the U.S. Green Building Council, um, which is leadership in energy and environmental design. And these programs, um, again, there's some things that you have to do uh, to get certified, but then there's also a whole bunch of options that you can do and obviously the more you do, the higher your score. And in the case of LEED, you can go all the way up to platinum, which is the highest you can go. And really it's, it's about making choices again that are about not only energy efficiency, um, although that's a big piece of it, but sustainability as well. So like the city of San Francisco requires new construction to be um, LEED silver. Um, and then we have many like ordinances within cities that are asking people to do benchmarking uh, or requiring, excuse me, requiring people to do benchmarking. And as I mentioned, I think, I believe the city of Seattle is requiring um, actual EMS systems so on new construction. So definitely probably leaning more towards the compliance, but again, there's definitely a reason to do it just for sustainability. 
And then, you know, finally, I mean, at the end of the day, energy demand and cost savings are a reflection of an EMS. I recently ran across um, a study that was done uh, in 2020. Uh, and so it was the best one that I found that kind of gave some real numbers. Uh, so basically it said uh, from their study, they found that if you implemented an EMS, you on average, the client saved between three to 9% um, on their energy consumption. Um, but they also said the first year cost in installation of the software was on average around eight cents per square foot. So the systems received a, usually a two year or less payback period. Uh, Obviously, we'd like to be closer to one, but at the end of the day, uh, which probably most of them are, a pretty decent payback. So again, it's definitely kind of worth its its money. And then, of course, there's also many utilities offering rebates and other incentives to encourage the use of these systems as well. All right, so we are about ready for a break here, but um, if there's any questions before we go to break, um, feel free to throw those out. And if not, that's fine. Um, you can throw some out while we're on break or when we come back, I'll double check. But we're gonna take a 10 minute break. So if everybody could come back at 11.20, that'd be great.
right, guys, welcome back. Um, Diane, I wanted to just check in with you, see if there's any questions before we kind of move on. Nope, they were good to go. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna move into our last section here, the BMS versus EMS. And we are gonna start with another um, activity here. And so I believe in this case as well, Diane, I need you to place both of those um, links um, into the chat for everybody. So what we're gonna do is there's two different options. There's two different articles here. You can choose one or two. You don't have to read both, um, but if you wanna pick option one or option two, it'll have you guys read that. Um, and again, this is gonna, hopefully we're gonna come back and talk about BMS versus EMS, but it, not only what the difference is, but why it's important to understand the difference. Um, and so we also have some reflection questions to kind of think about while you're reading this. You know, why is it valuable to understand the difference and kind of where is the waters muddied between a BMS and EMS? Um, and we'll have again, a little poll afterwards. Um, in this case, um, these articles are pretty short. So let's go ahead and, um, maybe give about seven minutes, between seven and eight minutes for this particular activity. And I'll just kind of come back on and um, as we get close to that time as well. All right, thank you.
right, let's see if we can start to kind of wrap that up. Just feel free to start participating in that poll whenever you're ready. Okay, got one response here so far. Difficult to understand. Okay, I can totally understand that. Hopefully I can shed a little more light on this subject here in a minute. Give another minute here. knowing what situation fits each type best. Okay, yeah, absolutely. All right, I think there's a second question here. Oops, I always hit that a little bit too quick. Okay, building managers may think they are doing all they can with just a BMS, but an EMS is needed to fully optimize the building's operations. Okay, that's a nice answer. Where the water's muddy, what are the hardware differences in each? Can you use a BMS hardware um, for an EMS? Um, good question, and uh, hopefully I can answer that in our next slide. So let me go ahead and move forward. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more. So I'm gonna ask you guys to just kind of stare at these two images, kind of see what you see, see if you see any differences, similarities, maybe think about what the pros and the cons of each are. And I'll go ahead and kind of just start sharing my thoughts and observations. So obviously the BMS, when you look at that particular image, you're gonna see a lot more stuff, right? It's just a lot more cluttered, a lot more. And in all honesty, a BMS takes a lot more to implement. Uh, and there's generally, I would say, a lot more hardware involved in a BMS. Um, but it really does even start even earlier in the design phase, kind of understanding what equipment, how many controllers, um, and really laying out the layout of all the devices and so forth. Uh, so there's definitely some effort already in the design phase, but then when you get into construction, generally every piece of major equipment will have its own controller. And then all those controllers need to go up to kind of a master controller. And for the most part, um, even still today, most things are hardwired. So there's a lot of wiring that has to occur in order to get all these things to start communicating to each other. And then of course, um, for the most part, even if we are using a manufacturer's piece of equipment, there's generally at least some level of programming. So sometimes a little, but sometimes a lot as far as custom programming for each building that has to occur. And then of course they have to do the startup and kind of troubleshooting. And generally that's kind of when I come into the picture as a commissioning agent, well, it's not the only time I come in, but this is an important part where we actually do a lot of testing on the equipment. Again, making sure it works and works as intended. And of course, there's like graphic screens and a lot of other things that happen on the BMS side um, before we're kind of done with the project. Now, if we look at the EMS, um, there I'm not going to say there's no hardware, um, but it's definitely a lot less. Um, sometimes it may just be a software overlay, um, but in general, definitely a lot less. But the other thing you might notice is, uh, again, those different charts and trends that you see um, on that computer screen. So the BMS has the capability to trend pretty much any point, any data point of the whole entire system. You know, So uh, for each piece of equipment, there could be hundreds of points. Um, it could be outside air temperature, you know, set points, um, 
positions of a valve or a damper. So a lot of information from the BMS, don't get me wrong. But generally, um, unless you specifically specify, um, generally what they'll do is they will trend the data and you can store it usually for a period of time. But for example, that outside air temperature, they will just trend it over time. So you can see what the outside air was for 24 hours or a week or whatever. So, it, and I'm not saying that that piece of data isn't important. It's just that on a BMS, it's usually not displayed in a way that actually, again, provides you something. I like to use the word actionable, something that's like, oh, there's something wrong. I need to go do something. And that's where the power of the EMS comes into play is that it could be looking at the same exact data as the BMS, uh, but hopefully we're using it, analyzing it, or and displaying it in a way that can provide us something that we could take action on. Go ahead to this next screen. Again, kind of driving this point a bit further. You know, a building management system really, um, I would say it originated, or its main intent was to control the building's equipment and facilitate maintenance. You know, be able to schedule something, you get an alarm if something fails. Uh, so it absolutely has a purpose. And, you know, nowadays they definitely are uh, evolving and, you know, hopefully it is simplifying the job of the chief engineers and, uh, facility managers. Um, you could even go so far, and this might be a little bit as to why the waters are muddy, okay, is a building management system, I mean, technically you could say it saves energy. I mean, at the end of the day, we're able, again, like I said, to schedule equipment on and off or simply turn it off, which we know saves energy if you're not using it. Um, you're able to go in there and make logic changes. So like if your chilled water system you want to go change how it's performing you could go you could make a logic change that hopefully would result in you know you running that system more efficiently so at the end of the day the building management system does play a role in this and i mean you could technically say it is an energy management system because it's saving energy but again it kind of goes back to how we analyze and display the data and so it's also not impossible to make a BMS into an EMS. You know, I, I would say that this is kind of, a, again, maybe a trend that's happening in the industry is that BMS manufacturers and vendors are seeing the, the desire to have some of these features and functions. So they're starting to add maybe bits and pieces to their software. I don't think they're there yet, but you know, if we had this presentation two years from now, it, it may be a different scenario. Um, but that's kind of where, you know, I would say kind of the main differences lie, um, but it's really easy to see how these two things can be kind of confused. Um, and like I said, the muddy water. But the reason I think it's also very important to understand the difference is again, because so many building engineers, uh, owners, even architects, engineers, they think they have an EMS when they have only have a BMS and they don't actually have those capabilities. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that when energy management systems kind of first came out or for many years, they were used primarily by the sustainability manager or maybe higher up, you know, they were used for information and reporting, uh, maybe reporting on your metrics to upper management or something like that. Um, so they were, that was the main purpose of those systems, but they also have evolved. And I think in honesty, more quickly than some of this building management systems, because now there's a lot of tools and functions within these energy management systems that are actually geared towards facility folks um, and help them do their job better uh, than what I would say it used to be. Um, so, yeah. Okay, let me go ahead and give a couple uh, quick analogies here. So um, the first one is dictionary I give, because if you think about it, um, the EMS is this dictionary. And if I gave you the definition of a word, not the word, but the definition, and let's say it's not an easy one, and I said, find it in this dictionary, I mean, how long would it take you to find it? Probably a long time. But if we were able to get a clue and it says, well, you're, it's definitely not in the first half of the dictionary, well, then you've eliminated 50% of your options. And then if you get another clue, you start what I call splitting the dictionary and another clue and another clue, and eventually you get to maybe only a couple pages. Um, and it maybe doesn't tell you exactly what the answer is, but now we have significantly reduced or narrowed our scope of focus. And so I would say that's what an EMS does. It doesn't always give you the answer, but it surely should be pointing you in the right direction and hopefully getting you closer and closer. So much more efficiently 
being able to, to kind of get there. Um, the other analogy here, our fruit salad, is basically if you think of, let's say, the BMS as a strawberry and the EMS as a raspberry, would you eat the fruit salad if it only had one of those two fruits? Probably yes, but if you could have both of them, would you prefer that? For me, it would be a yes. Um, so at the end of the day, I think for the most part, having both systems um, is a plus in, in the ideal scenario because they definitely do complement each other and kind of work together. And so here, maybe here's a way to kind of bring it together by giving an example. Um, we have a package unit, um, air handling unit. And again, it, this might also be similar to one of the questions asked earlier about the plant and the KW per ton. But here's an example where now, you know, where we looked at that pie data and we said, oh, HVAC was the largest category. Now I need to dig in a bit deeper. So in this particular case, we were able to create a metric, CFM per watt. CFM is, um, again, the airflow of this unit, and it's a typical data point that you would find on your BMS. And then watts, of course, is our energy. And so if we put these two together, we can create this metric CFM per watt. And that's generally what the manufacturer will do to define the efficiency of this equipment. So as I mentioned, we could look at, see if it's performing as a manufactured states or also if the engineer again defines kind of this is where you should be running it in it gives us another metric um i like to say it gives us more tools in our tool belt you know it lets us to create these specific metrics that ultimately provide us more useful information so that we can dig deeper and do more and make better choices um, and decisions okay and now i'm going to give um a real a a real world example here. Um, so this is an air handling unit and this is a BMS graphic screen. And I know there's a lot of information on here, so don't, don't get too worried about it. But ultimately um, there's a lot of things out there for, again, as I mentioned, control strategies to help um, save energy. Um, one of them is called ASHRAE Guideline 36. And it's basically meant to be a high performance sequence of operations for um, HVAC equipment. And so one of the uh, strategies is to change the supply air temperature set point. And um, so it, the set point for this air handler can go from 55 degrees all the way up to 68 degrees. And um, what we, when I started doing commissioning, usually that strategy was just based on outside air temperature. So the hotter it was outside, the lower we would set our supply air temperature. And then obviously if it was cooler outside, we don't need as much cooling we would let that set point float up to 68 degrees and hopefully save a little bit of energy in that process. So that's uh, you know, an energy efficiency strategy. Nowadays, again, with this guideline 36, we found a better way to do it or a way to save a bit more energy. And so what, instead of looking at the outside air, we will look at all the different zones within the building. So typically uh, I might talk about a building that has a, a variable air box okay and each box usually is tied to a thermostat and so that kind of is what's called a zone and so each zone has its thermostat and if that particular zone gets above its set point it will call for um, basically a request for cooling and so that's what these numbers are that you're seeing right here and so we're going to actually reset the uh, supply air temperature based on the actual load in the building because at the end of the day, maybe there's nobody in the building or there's very few people for some reason. And so we don't, even though it may be hot outside, maybe we don't need to reset it down to 55 degrees. So that's kind of the principle is to do what actually is needed in the building, again, to save a bit more energy. But a lot of times when these things get implemented, they there's a lot of complexity behind it because all these values like this ignore and this request, it gets into this complicated control logic and a lot of people don't understand it. And so it sometimes gets set up and left as is, and then everybody walks away and that's how it is for the rest of the life of the building. And what can happen is you can have hundreds of zones in a, in a fairly large building, you might have hundreds of zones and one zone calling for cooling could drive your entire system from 68 degrees down to 55 degrees. And then in that process, say also we'll have like a time interval. So how quickly do we get from 68 to 58? that is also set by the controls contractor. So it could be, sometimes I've seen five minutes, sometimes I've seen 10 or 15, but like for example, five minutes to go from 65 to 55, that's a really short period of time. And no building needs to respond that quickly. 
So what I see a lot of times in commissioning is I will come into a building that has implemented this control strategy and it literally sits at 55 degrees all the time. It doesn't reset. So we're clearly not saving energy. So even though this you know, control strategy has the ability to save energy and maybe more than just set resetting on outside air as I described, a lot of times it's not implemented correctly. And so, you know, again, how do you know that? So I'm gonna show you this, and this is a, a client that I worked with who has an EMS system. And again, I'm gonna show you this heat map. And what you're looking at is every single VAV or HVAC zone within the building. And we're looking at over, I'm guessing a, a week or two here of data. And obviously green means good, red means bad. So again, you can clearly look at this really easy and see, oh man, I got one zone that's always in the red. You know, what's the reason behind it? I can go investigate. And there's lots of reasons it could be that way. Something could be broken. Um, maybe the box is undersized or maybe the space was sized for 10 people and the client's using it for like 50 people. And so the load is just more than what it can handle. I mean, there's obviously a lot of reasons why this could be read, but at least this lets you easily get to the root cause. Now, if, you, if I go back really quickly, the old fashioned way of doing that on the BMS would be to literally, there's a graphic screen like this for every VAV or HVAC zone. And it would show you the set point and the actual temperature in that HVAC zone. You would literally have to click through each one of those to find them. So if you had hundreds in your building, it would, again, take you a long time to get there. So that's where maybe kind of splitting the dictionary, this doesn't tell me exactly what's wrong, but it definitely told me where to go. And uh, you know I'm pretty close now. Um, so again, this is where this type of visualization is extremely powerful. And again, something that a facilities person would probably use um, a lot. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about new construction uh, and how the implementation of an EMS might go. Um, so in, at least in California for Title 24, um, it requires us to segregate, again, our loads at the electrical panel. Um, by doing this, it, it makes it extremely easy to put in submeters and basically put your data in, in by end use here. Um, so that's something that we pretty much see on all buildings. But what's not typical is just because we install these submeters that that information doesn't necessarily go to an energy management system or it doesn't necessarily go to a BMS. That's where we need to define that um, in the design of the project. Um, but again, if we do have an EMS, uh, we can look at this data and again, see how energy is being used and be able to dive in a bit deeper. Um, and like I said, most new constructions will have a BMS, but not necessarily an EMS. So there's probably a ton of design considerations. I'm just gonna probably list a few here. Um, but kind of going back to those you know, segregated loads, um, you know, that really has to be defined in the design phase, you know, so that it can be laid out and installed and implemented as you want it to. And so similarly with an EMS, we definitely need to start thinking of it in the design phase and we can't, I mean, I definitely have seen projects where they've installed it after the fact, and I'm not saying you can't, but obviously if you kind of can start defining it earlier, you're probably gonna get better results. So some of the things that I kind of work with clients is to, to understand who is, kind of the audience for this EMS? Because again, is it the sustainability manager? Is it the facilities engineers? Maybe it's both, but it does matter who your audience is because maybe what the information you put on here and the way you display the data uh, would be catered towards the appropriate person. Um, and there is a case to be able to, you know, satisfy multiple parties, not just one, but it is good to understand who, who the information and who's gonna be using it. Um, also, of course, what metrics you wanna measure. So again, defining those early is actually probably essential because that's one that I would say you absolutely have to do because you need to understand what you're gonna measure so that you can make sure that you have the infrastructure, the sensors, the hardware, the IT, the network, the security, like everything, there's just a lot that actually does go into it. But um, so defining that early and then how to display the data. Um, that one's a little bit harder for specifically for owners to understand is, you know, how, I don't know how to, what it should look like. And that's okay. Usually the vendors will have some templates. And of course there's, 
should be some consultants that can kind of help along the way. You know, myself as a commissioning agent, but engineers, architects, other people can kind of help um, kind of guide that. But sometimes defining that is, is critical too. Um, one other, th maybe two other things really quickly. Um, the other thing that I see a lot of is that, again, because we can get so much information now from pieces of equipment, um, for example, on an air handler, there's a VFD, um, a variable speed drive, so that we can speed up and speed down the fan. Um, and let's say you have 10 of those on your project. Those VFDs, each one of those VFDs could have 100 points on them. But the ones probably you would only use is KW or KWH. I mean, the rest of the points probably not gonna use. Maybe there's a few, but I would say a handful versus all 100. What I see a lot of people doing as well, why not? The more, the better. Let's bring it all in. But I will kind of warn you that sometimes too much data is not good. It can be kind of cloud and make it more, again, more difficult to find things that you're looking for. So what I like to do is kind of work with clients and engineers to define exactly what we want to measure. We can always add some later, but uh, it is better to kind of tailor it to exactly what you need the best you can. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of these EMS can be delivered or procured in a lot of different ways. I mean, you can simply just buy the software. Uh, you can buy the software as a service and you can even buy it and have kind of like a consultant that actually does monthly reporting or kind of actually monitors it for you and looks for if energy efficiency projects for you and kind of works with you to do that. Um, you know, if you don't maybe have the infrastructure or be able to set up that team or process that uh, I mentioned earlier. So there's definitely different ways you can, um, like I said, purchase an EMS as well. Okay, well, what about existing buildings, retrofit, or maybe even small projects that don't have a BMS? Um, so on retrofits, I, I think these are the three things that I see the most of. There's probably also a couple other methods, but generally I will see us either rip and replace everything, we attempt to try to upgrade it, um, or the last one, which is the one I kind of like, is enabled devices. Uh, so this, we're showing a picture of Senseware, but there's plenty of manufacturers and brands out there. Um, so another one of the things that we do at Red Car Analytics is we go into existing buildings and we monitor them uh, for energy efficiency measures that are part of the, the Title 24 California Energy Code to see if they actually are working and they're actually saving energy. So one of the ways we do that is go in there and use these devices. Um, there's all sorts of devices from measuring, again, electricity to measuring CO2 or temperature. Um, and essentially they're like data loggers, but they all go up to the cloud and you can make pretty charts or graphs and things with them. Um, what's nice about them is they're pretty cost effective. Um, they're customizable. And so you, again, don't need to measure everything. You could just measure what you want to measure. Um, and so what I also like about it is, again, kind of as I mentioned, a lot of these EMS systems are built for larger clients, where this could be a really great solution for a smaller client, or again, one who doesn't actually have a BMS. Um, because at the end of the day, in order to reach our climate goals uh, and zero net energy, we need building solutions for everyone. I mean, there has to be a solution for all customers regarding size and budget. And so there may not be a lot of them. I think they're starting to kind of evolve, but this is, in this case, this is one of those. Okay. Um, so we have about nine minutes left. Um, I don't know if we have enough time to go ahead and read this, but I wanted to get this QR code. So this was the blog that I was discussing mentioning previously. Um, feel free to go check it out and read it. I wrote it with the intention to, again, be able to give it to my clients, owners, architects, engineers, whoever, so that they could kind of maybe get a better understanding of what an EMS is. And again, those differences between a BMS and EMS, so they can start asking questions of their consultants or their contractors to hopefully get some, you know, a system that's more for what they actually need and want. Um, but it really hopefully is kind of sparked some of those questions um, and clarify some of that confusion that's out there. All right. And so we have one last poll here um, and definitely have a opportunity for any questions as well, but love to hear kind of what your key takeaway is regarding a BMS versus an EMS. give a few minutes here if anybody wants to share. 
or ask any questions. Okay, the difference between them. Okay, great. Hopefully I've been able to answer that at least somewhat for you guys or definitely hopefully brought some more or a little bit of clarity to that. All right, well, I'll go ahead to our recap. Um, I'm not sure if it actually closes the poll when I move to the next slide, but again, um, we have the question box if there's any um, lingering questions. But yeah, just as a recap, um, hopefully I've been able to shed a little bit of light about what, uh, you know, the definition of an EMS and why we might need one. And again, the difference between a BMS and an EMS. And you know, started to obviously get into a little bit about the value of an EMS and how to successfully implement it. We will definitely get more into that, how do I successfully implement and use one a little bit more in day two. Um, so yeah, I appreciate everybody's uh, participation today. And like I said, I'll uh, see if anybody has any further questions or I'll turn it back over to Sean. Um, Sean, do you want me to stop sharing? Uh, no, I will take care of that, Michelle. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Michelle and Diane. Thank you. Uh, if there are additional questions, please go ahead and keep typing them. I am going to take control back for just a couple of additional reminder slides here. However, um, I would also, before I sort of dive into some of that stuff for just a moment, um, I would say that, that to amplify a little bit on, on some of the stuff that Michelle has said here, um, as she said, you know, convincing owners to, to invest in these kind of systems can sometimes be a little, little funky, but I will tell you that on a number of projects that I've been involved in, uh, we've actually had success talking to owners uh, about dashboarding systems like this. So uh, one of the ways that we've kind of discussed this with them is if you'll remember, you know, in an old style office building, you walk in and you'll typically see something on the wall that tells you what the barometric pressure is, what the wind speed is, you know, it's essentially a weather system. If you haven't seen one of these in an old building, well, they used to be everywhere on the East Coast, uh, go to the securities building on uh, 3rd and Stewart, you'll see one in there currently that's still, that's still functional. Um, we've actually had pretty good success talking about um, these kinds of EMS dashboarding systems and actually putting them into building lobbies so that people can have a good idea about what their energy impact is. It seems like a small thing, but it really, it, people like to know what, what's happening with stuff like that. So um, that ties in with, with, you know, any of you who have taken my classes will always know that I, I continually talk about uh, commissioning the occupants, right? Letting them know what's happening and why. So before we, we uh, jump into that, just a couple of more words here from the uh, Lighting Design Lab. Uh, as uh, Michelle has mentioned, next week, same time, same channel. Uh, some of you may know, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, June 2nd, 10 to noon, we'll have the second part of energy management systems here. And as Michelle mentions, uh, it's, it's more about uh, implementing these systems in some case studies. Uh, then June 14th and 16th, we'll have uh, commercial refrigeration, parts one and two. June 21 and 23, we'll have adjustable variable speed frequency drives, parts one and two. 
And then in July, Armando Verdil and I will uh, give you a recap on what we've seen from Lightfair this year, uh, you know, what the latest trends are and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, with that, then I'm also going to say, if you have any questions, please go ahead and uh, contact me, any feedback, any of those other things. Please go ahead and fill out the review uh, and um, uh, information feedback that you'll get from GoToWebinar, uh, particularly with respect to any other educational opportunities you might want to see. We are, of course, Lighting Design Lab and uh, uh, Seattle City Light. Now, Diane, have, uh, I have lost track of the questions. Have there been any supplemental questions? Sorry, no, there weren't any more questions after that. Okay, this is your last chance, folks. Questions, questions, questions. You've got uh, Michelle and Diane here ready to answer all of your burning questions. <laughs> Another minute or so. Otherwise, if none come in, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much to uh, Michelle for a uh, another uh, wonderful webinar and to Diane for uh, doing such a great job of uh, curating questions and keeping an eye on things. And I'm still not seeing anything new coming in. So uh, I am going to say, again, please take the online survey. But uh, we'll see you next week. Um, the, I, from, from my perspective uh, as, as an educator in, in other ways, um, th the second part of this, this class is usually, uh, or similar classes, uh, is usually the more interesting one. So please make sure you go ahead and sign up for that class as well, because the implementation, you know, the foundational stuff is very important but the implementation is, is critical. So uh, Diane and uh, Michelle, any last words? Uh, no, just uh, again, appreciate everybody's participation and looking forward to next week. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, everyone have a lovely sunny afternoon and we will see you next week. Thank you. Thanks.